about three weeks ago, I went to eat lunch with a friend of mine, and he was on his way out of town, and after we had eaten lunch, right at the very end of the meal, he goes, do you have any book suggestions for my vacation? And I quickly named one of my favorite authors. I was like, read anything by this guy. It's a guy named A.J. Jacobs. Uh, A.J. Jacobs is uh, a journalist in New York City, and he writes long-form literature, which means he picks a topic, he studies it, and he writes about all of his findings and learnings. One of the, uh, after having lunch with my friend, uh, he read one of those on vacation, and I started rereading the very first one of A.J.'s books I ever read. It's a book called The Year of Living Biblically. Uh, Jacobs is uh, not religious, but he's Jewish by ethnicity. So what he decides to do is to read the Old Testament Mosaic laws and to figure out how you live those out in modern-day New York. So he comes to some interesting findings. It's really difficult to find a goat to sacrifice in New York City and not get in trouble with the Humane Society. Uh, he, he, comes up, he comes along a, a passage that says you should stone the adulterer, and he's like, mm, this seems like this could be difficult. So he takes a bunch of tiny pebbles, and he sits in Central Park, and he's like, I just assumed everybody had made a mistake. So when everybody walked by, he would try to throw it at their ankle to see if they didn't notice. Uh, so it, it's just this fascinating book uh, about uh, exploring what it was that God had called ancient Israel and how he called them to live. One of the comments that Jacobus makes is he said, of all the things that were difficult to live out in his everyday life, he was so challenged by God's impetus that the people of Israel should be people who did not gossip and did not lie, that the words out of their mouths should be pure and right and true. He said this is particularly challenged when you work in celebrity journalism in New York City. And so he writes about that tension, but I wonder. I wonder if A.J. is not the only one who might wrestle with the things that come out of our mouth. That's the challenge that we're going to find in the scripture that we read together this morning. My name is Will Rambo. I'm one of the pastors here at the Orchard. We're delighted that of all the things you could do this Sunday morning, whether you're here in the room uh, on Coley Road or if you're joining us online, however and wherever, uh, we're just glad that you're here. As we continue in our series called A Field Guide to Romans, where we're spending the summer walking through the book of Romans. Now, if you have a Bible with you, we're going to be in Romans 14. Now, if you didn't bring a Bible with you and you want to read along, some of our greeters are moving around the room. They'd love to bring you a Bible. You can raise your hand right where you're seated. They'll bring you a Bible. You can follow along. Romans 14. I did notice we didn't have the page number. 683. How about that for service? 683. My friend Kristen went and ran and got one of our Bibles to make sure we had the right page number. 683 will get you to Romans chapter 14. You can use this Bible during the service. Leave it in chair when you're done. But if you don't own a Bible that you can read and understand, we would love for you to keep this Bible, our free gift to you. We believe the Bible is the Word of God, that by reading it, we understand more and more the truth of who God is, and in view of that, who we are called to be. So if that Bible, this Bible would help you on your journey, we want you to take it today, our gift to you. Romans 14, we're going to read 1 through 13. Let me give you just a little bit of context. For the first uh, number of weeks of our series, we walked through Romans 1 through 11, where we talked about the, the theology, the thoughts, the doctrine, the beliefs uh, that God has, uh, that Paul was sharing about who God was and the truth of who Jesus is. Uh, last Sunday, we got to Romans 12, and we begin to make a shift now into what does this actually mean in our lives? Practically, how do we begin to live like Jesus calls us to live in relationship with other people. That's what we're going to continue talking about today here in Romans 14. So let's read 1 through 13, and then let's walk through it together. Romans 14, 1 through 13. Accept other believers who are weak in faith, and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will only eat vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall, and with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. In the same way, some think one day is more holy than another day, 
while others think every day is alike. You should be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Those who worship the Lord on a special day do it to honor him. Those who eat any kind of food do so to honor the Lord, since they give thanks to God before eating. And those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. Verse 7. For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to the honor of the Lord. And if we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, to be Lord both of the living and the dead. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will confess and give praise to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. So Paul, writing here in Romans 14, is writing about actual circumstances that are unfolding on the ground in this first century church. There are a number of debates, a number of issues that they were wrestling through. They were wrestling about specifically about what food could be eaten at a table. There was a discussion about some groups believed that certain meats were unclean, more than just certain meats, particularly meats that had been offered to idols. While there was another group that goes, well, those idols aren't real anything, so it doesn't matter the intent. Why would we be wasteful with what is already available? Some wanted to be out of the discussion so much that they ate vegetables only. So they're having these arguments, and Paul goes, this is not an essential issue. Why do you keep arguing? Why are you creating tension around the table? Groups of of followers of Jesus would gather in a home, in a room. They would share a meal, and instead of encouraging one another, they'd start fighting about things like who could eat what and who shouldn't eat what. Paul says, this is silly. Paul goes on to say, some argue about what are holy days. The reason this was an early uh, issue is, if you think about it being Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, Jewish Christians still wanted to keep the Sabbath on Saturday as a nod to the history of what God had done through the people of Israel, um, pointing back towards the Ten Commandments. But the newer Christians, particularly the Gentile Christians, go, but Jesus was raised from the dead on Sunday, so we should celebrate Sabbath on Sunday because it is the Lord's day. And so there was this bickering and arguing. Paul's point is, if someone wants to take a day to grow in their relationship, to give honor and glory and praise and worship to God, why do you care what day of the week it is? One day is not more holy than another. That's Paul's argument. 2,000 years ago in this first century issue they're squabbling they're fighting i don't know if any of you did but if you ever grew up in church or around a church that you felt like argued about non-essential issues if you grew up in churches or around churches that argued about what color the carpet should be or what groups could use certain rooms of a certain building if you grew up around those kind of arguments don't think it suddenly got broken they were arguing about it one generation Uh, the generation of which Jesus had died and been resurrected. They're already having those arguments. A couple hundred years later, St. Augustine comes along, and Augustine says this, In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty or freedom. In all things, charity or love. Augustine, trying to, to clarify this idea that Paul raises in Romans 14, goes, look, In the things that matter, we should be on the same page. In non-essential issues, there should be liberty. There should be freedom to, to choose and pick and choose as you please. But in all things, we should be loving. Friends, if you were to, if you were here today and you're not a follower of Jesus, you're just curious. I wonder what, you, you bring such valuable information to us. I wonder what would be your natural impression of those who follow Jesus. Friends, if we're here today and we do follow Jesus... If we were to go to lunch or have a cup of coffee with a friend of ours who is not interested in faith, I wonder what their natural impression is based on the way we handle our social media, based on the way that we represent ourselves, by the way we engage in conversation 
an argument? When is the last time you sat down with somebody who wasn't interested in faith and learned from them, asked questions about what created the barriers that they feel? That's Paul's concern. Paul's concern is that those who are far away from Jesus will be uninterested because of the tenor and the banter that's taking place among the early Christians. I wonder if he would be concerned the same today. Friends, we want to be unified about the things that are essential. We want to say there are some things that are non-essential, but in all things, let it be said of us that we were loving, that we were filled with the love of Jesus, overwhelmed by it, and the way we interact with everyone on everything is loving. Uh, if you have not caught wind, we'll fill you in later, but uh, in the last month, the Orchard has purchased another building here in town, a church on Thomas Street, where student ministry and some new opportunities for mission and outreach are going to take place at 900 South Thomas. It's been the home of a church, a Pentecostal church called Life at Tupelo. As we began to visit with them and they explored what was next for them, they couldn't find a place to worship. And out of options, we began to pray with them and we came up with a very simple solution. They'll meet right here in this room. We'll get through about 1 o'clock today. They'll get here about 1.10 today. And they'll pra their band will practice like ours did this morning. And then they'll have worship here this afternoon at 4. How long are they going to meet here? I don't know. As long as they need to. Uh, do we think if we were to sit down and dissect every issue, do we agree on every issue? Probably not. After having conversations with them and knowing their pastor for a couple years, do we agree on the essentials? Absolutely. Do we want to see their church and our church continue to grow? So why would we be selfish about brick and mortar unequivocally? We want them to grow and we want to grow. This is why for 23 years we've talked about being a kingdom-minded church. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, love and charity. That's what Paul is trying to establish then. It's what he's asking of us today. So but when it actually gets pressed down, I think there are some ways we can apply Paul's instruction, what he was saying to the first church and what he's saying to us today. If you like lists, this is a good time to kind of think through a few things. You can grab a note card somewhere in front of you or a pen and be able to, to jot along. I think the first thing Paul is asking of them and us is to quit being critical. To quit being critical uh, this conversation is, is so strongly directed for Paul because he, he keeps laying it down in the matter of who has strength, those who are strong in their faith and those who are weak. And he is writing it directed at those who are strong in their faith. He says you've got to be patient. You've got to create space. Look at those first few verses. Um, be gentle with those with a sensitive conscience. Paul is trying to invite them to stop belittling one another. To, start, to stop offering criticism and casting judgment so quickly. This can become an, an, an unintentional part of our personality. Friends, snark, criticism, sarcasm, these are not fruits of the Spirit. I'm all for a good joke here and there, but we, we have to be honest about knowing when. Maturity is simply knowing when to be mature, right? Right? It's knowing when to exercise that kind of humor and when it's time to pull it back because we're with somebody who maybe it would be more painful than we intended it to be. I remember early on, my wife Marissa and I have been married a little over 15 years, and in one of our early dates, she said something that has always stuck with me. Marissa said, uh, I, I talked about, hey, I, I would love to know how I, can, how I can be better, how I can care for you, like what's important to you. And this is what she said. She said, don't make me the butt of your jokes. Don't make me the butt of your jokes. And it's been foundational in our marriage, but I, I wonder if it shouldn't be foundational in every one of our friendships. When we really love well, should someone else become the butt of our joke? Sarcasm, the word sarcasm in Latin, the original word, is the same word that's used to describe an e eagle ripping the flesh off another animal. That's the word we get for sarcasm. It's a, it's a very visual word. What Paul is saying is quit being critical. Don't let it be our, our natural response is to make a joke out of everything. If that's all we do, then what's going on within us that lets that be the cap of what we're willing to offer someone else? I think an, another thing that Paul is pressing on us is responsibility 
our responsibility should always be more important than our rights. Our responsibility to one another should always be more important than our individual rights. As a part of community, Paul's raising that. As a follower of Jesus, my responsibility to others it supersedes my individual needs. Now that's a challenging way of thinking to our Western mindset. It's uh, incredibly appropriate, it's obviously biblical, and even if it is challenging. When we enter into a fam- the family of God, when we enter into this relationship with one another, we take responsibility for one another that then supersedes our individual rights. I'm no longer my own. I, d- I don't just belong to me. Uh, Paul says this in verse 7. He says, look, we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. Verse 8, if we live, it is for the Lord. If we die, it's for the Lord. We are not our own. We are not our own, and Paul is challenging them. And I think it challenges us. And look, before you type the email you may be thinking about typing right now, let's talk through this and let's think about this. If the community of faith can't gather together and and have some introspection, then why do we gather? Uh, Let's take one area of the world. One one that I, I admit this illustration may not work for everybody, but I think the point will carry. In the sports world, we love to talk about a team player. We love to talk about a team player. They put the team first. Uh, there, there are coaches who have had entire movements on we is greater than me. There is no I in team, right? I mean, I feel like I could do a coach's post game right now. I mean, like, I've got all the axioms down. We is greater than me. There is no I in team. We applaud that. There are some of us in this room who, if we see an individual player elevate themselves over their teammates, we will go off about it. We will rant about it on social media. Selfish, me first generation. We will call out these young athletes all the while. We do exactly the same thing when it comes to our individual freedoms. This is not a, I'm not having any form of, please don't take words that have multiple meetings and think I'm making some comment about politics. I'm not at all. I'm saying what Paul was challenging them and what he's challenging us to is to see the responsibility to have one another is greater than you and I just doing what we want to do. Paul hammers it here, and he's so consistent. In in, uh, 1 Corinthians 10 is another passage that Paul writes, and he says, you say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial Don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. Friends, when those who are not interested in Jesus have questions, one of the questions I so often get asked is why do we not bend to all of Scripture rather than picking the parts that we want to bend towards? Paul is challenging this place where we find the balance of enjoying the beauty and the gift that it is to live in this great nation while we find what it means to have a greater kingdom with which we offer our lives to, as Brian talked to us about last week, as a living sacrifice. That's what Paul is challenging. And and one last piece that I think Paul challenges us is that Jesus will judge. Not your job to judge, it's not my job to judge. That's not our role. Jesus will judge. Paul says in verse 12, one day we will all give a personal account to God. There will be an account, and we are to let Christ handle it. One of the things we say to our kids is when they start trying to parent one another, we keep reminding them, you're not your sibling's parent. That's our job. That's our responsibility. I want them to love, encourage, and challenge one another, but I do not want them to feel a need to parent one another. In a community of faith, we've got to learn how to love, challenge, encourage, push, ask questions without being judgmental and without being angry. No one has ever, ever been convinced because of a quality social media post and rant. That is not going to be the answer. We've got to find a way to embody what Paul is raising. And look, in a room this size and an audience watching online, if you're here today, If you're tuning in today and you've been hurt or wounded because of the words of somebody else as a follower of Jesus who said things that that brought only shame upon you, let me tell you, I am so sorry. If you've been caught in the arrows of some theological argument, I'm so sorry. 
All I can hope for is that if you journey with us long enough that you will see that we are trying to figure out what it means to let every word we speak be saturated in the grace and love of Jesus Christ. We are figuring it out as we go. and We'd love for you to join us as we go along. Now look, so Paul says these three things. Quit being critical. Critical Responsibility is greater than rights. Jesus will be the judge. But I want to be real clear about one thing Paul does not say. Paul does not say there is untethered permissiveness. Paul does not say everything goes. Paul is not giving permission for those who are, not follow, who are new followers of Jesus to do just anything what, that they want. Earlier in Romans, Romans chapter 6, the whole argument that Paul gives is, do we go on sinning so grace can abound more and more? No, that's not the argument that Paul is making. And, and I, I want to use good logic here. Untethered permissiveness can't be the way. You know why? I can't do just what I want because I have a responsibility to other people. We have a responsibility to one another. That means we all have to check a little bit of the way that we want it to be and choose instead the way that Jesus wants things to be. That's the challenge that Paul raises. We, we need to be challenged. We do need to be pushed. We need to be held accountable. One of my favorite things to say, I say it all the time in conversation, we've talked about it around here before, is that, uh, it didn't make it on the screen, but is that accountability always sounds like judgment when we don't want to hear it. Accountability always sounds like judgment when we don't want to hear it. We need to be challenged. It's not untethered permissiveness. But in our pushing and challenging one another, the joy can't be in proving the other person wrong, but that both of us become a little bit more who Jesus has called us to be. So how? When we're honest, it can be real easy. I got lots of opinions about lots of things. From the best chicken wings in Tupelo to the way people ought to live their lives, I have lots of opinions. In a world where we all have lots of opinions, how does Paul want us to live this out? I think there's three things we can remember. One, we evaluate our own hearts. Evaluate our own hearts. Before I'm quick to be critical of someone else, I don't need to assume by position or age or authority that I know that I'm right. I first need to evaluate my own heart. We are so prone. I am so prone to believing that my opinion is the best opinion. But there is not a place in Scripture that justifies that thought or action, and there's not a stick of evidence in the last 43 years that proves I'm right all the time. We need to evaluate our own hearts. There's an ancient practice called the daily examine, where you take the few minutes at the end of the day, you think through your day and give thanks to God for all that was good, you make note of where God is moving, and then you offer a prayer of gratitude and of placing the things that you can't control at his altar. Just a simple way to take a few minutes away from the noise to evaluate our own hearts. Psalm 139 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Psalm 139, 23 and 24. We need to evaluate our own hearts. Number two, we need to choose intentional inconvenience. Intentional inconvenience. Paul is offering this way of life where one is choosing to withhold their own thoughts and opinions to better serve and love and care for someone else. Sometimes I need to choose what I don't want. Sometimes I need to sit in a room where I have the weight and responsibility and authority to speak up and withhold my opinion as a way of intentionally inconveniencing myself because the only way we grow is by having the opportunity to make decisions and choices. I need to create space for leaders that are a part of my team to do that very thing. Uh, there's a reason that uh, we invite you to periodically give our lives away and to do it not always that most easily fits your schedule. We, sometimes we need to choose intentional inconvenience. Then in the service, we're going to talk about some serving opportunities that are coming up. And not all of them are perfectly fit to everybody's schedule, but if a few people could choose to be intentionally inconvenienced at each of those opportunities, then we get to serve the kingdom of God in our city. There's a reason fasting 
has been a spiritual discipline for so long, the intentionally inconveniencing ourselves to remind us, to help us become more aware of our dependency on God. Choose intentional inconvenience. And the last piece is we need to keep growing. We need to keep growing. We need to move from weakness to strength. We need to be honest as we evaluate our hearts about places we're still battling. I'm, I've been in ministry 22 years. I'm meeting with a coach regularly right now because I want to keep growing. I'm not finished yet. I've not arrived. And until my lungs run out of breath, I will not arrive. I want to keep growing. How are you growing? How are you being stretched? Who's speaking truth into your life? Who's helping form and shape you? I have a good friend who always reminds me that if you've only been following Jesus day two, you've got to look around and see who can help who's on day one. It doesn't matter where you are on the process. We all need to figure out how to keep growing, keep being stretched, keep being formed so that we become more and more the people that Jesus has created us to become. I, I got on a Zoom call this week with my friend Joey Bates who's preaching at our church in Oxford. He's on staff there. And Joey made a phenomenal comment that really struck me. Joey said this, the same grace that saves us from the damnation of hell is the same grace that empowers us to live as citizens of heaven. Becoming completely reliant on his grace, completely enveloped in his presence, completely pure in him is the goal of our Christian life. To become more and more like Jesus, not just to keep us from hell, but to infuse our life with the life of heaven. Paul is trying to give us an image and a way and an opportunity to do just that. As I got to the end of a year living biblically, rereading it over the last month or so, uh, Jacob makes this comment that's so powerful. Jacob says, you start to realize how much of our speech is the evil tongue. One of the best parts of the year was realizing that when you stop saying negative things about people, you start thinking more positively about them. You realize how much the outer is affected by the inner. Friends, if, if a really talented author who's not really interested in faith can say something so profound, shouldn't we listen and learn? We begin to realize how much the outer of our life is affected by the inner. And so I wonder, what is our outer world? What do the words of our mouth and the actions of our life speak about what's going on within us? Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Reveal anything in me that is not of you so that I might walk on the path to everlasting life. Search me, O oh God. Friends, wherever you are today, Grace is so good. Love is so much more profound than we can wrap our brains around. And Jesus is so kind. He meets us right where we are today with our doubts, our wrestlings, our words, and our mistakes. But his love refuses to leave us where we are found. As we follow after him, we will become more and more each day a unified people the people we has called, crafted, and created us to become. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word challenges and pushes us. And Lord, I pray this day that we would be cognizant of the way that we use our words. Words are so powerful. In a room this size, and those that are watching online, there are some of us that are so affected. We, we play on repeat in the manuscript of our mind the words that others have spoken. So Lord, one, I pray that you would free us from all the damaging words that have been spoken over us. And Lord, I pray that you'd bring healing to our hearts, that the words we speak would bring life and not death hope and not discouragement. Lord, the reality is we're all weak. We are saved simply by the one who was strong enough to be intentionally inconvenienced, to choose his responsibility over his heavenly rights 
And he laid all those things aside to redeem the likes of us. May we become more aware of the gift that was given on our behalf that we might become more the same sort of gift to the world that is around us. To you, our Father, in the name of Jesus and by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.